If you like marketing, if you're scaling a business, if you're into entrepreneurship, you are in the right place. My name is Ethan, Ethan from Thirst, as I like to call myself. And this is my podcast, Ethan's Angle. I hope you enjoy. Ethan Nation, welcome back. Just when you thought it was just going to be me yelling at you at my podcast by myself for the rest of the history of my podcast, here I come in with another legendary guest. Holy crap, dude, it's a long time coming. Omar, um, tell us about yourself. I don't even want, I don't, creative director for Wags Capital, and they've got an unreal amount of stuff going on. I look up to this dude, huge, big time. Uh, we just met, has it been like a month or two months or something? <laughs> Not two too months. long ago at all, but um, I'm just excited. I think one of the things I think about a lot is when minds think alike, you can quickly tell. You know what I mean? You can quickly tell. And I think that's uh, one thing I picked up when I first met you was like, we just kind of clicked and we understood each other and we spoke the same kind of language. And um, it's been really fun to kind of chop it up with him on the surface level. But today I'm going to figure out all about Omar and what he's about and his backstory and everything. So give it to me, man. I want to hear the story. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Tell me the story of Omar. Tell me how you got to this position that you're in now and give us the whole rundown because you got yourself a story. Let's do it. Thank you, Ethan. So first of all, it's an honor to be here with you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And I think you nailed it on the head. When you meet someone that is on the same wavelength as you, you can talk the same talk because game recognizes game. Like, that's just how yeah. it is. Yeah. And I've always, just like you, hustle mentality. And when I say hustle mentality, I've just been a risk taker since I was a kid. From running for student council and being like a new kid on the block but trying to, you know, end winning. I know that's a silly thing, but I've learned from an early age that it's okay to put yourself out there and not be afraid to lose. And um, I also learned at an early age the importance and the value of community, the importance and value of relationships. Unintentionally, I just like people, yeah. and so that's played a major role into my life and everything that I've done. Why um, are you so nice to people? Like, <laughs> where did that come from? If we're telling the story from way back, like, you're unbelievably friendly, you have an abundance mentality, I think that at least a lot of not, maybe not necessarily other winning business people do, or, you know, winning business people that at least people look up to. Not all the time, like, are they super nice or, like, have abundance? That, Interesting. How did that come from? I've never been asked that question, honestly, and I've never thought about it, but I can tell you it 100% comes from being scared of not having friends. Really? If when you're young, like insecure, like yeah, like, insecurity well, yeah, insecu a hundred percent security. When you're young and you don't have any friends or and a little kid and you try to make friends or you, you tend, or at least I was always scared to make a fool out of myself or not be the cool kid, be picked last in, yeah. in all the things. And so I found that being nice to people, especially like in junior high and high school, being nice to people was uh, a better way of expanding friendships and friendship circles and you have a less likelihood of failing in that yeah. aspect and i always found i would hide my insecurities through being um overly uh, nice to people really interesting I love it. Okay, so you're friends with everyone growing up when you're little. You're running for a free yeah. student body. Yeah. You're going all in on everything kind of guy. Always. I always go all in on what I do without even knowing it. Yeah. So I always act and then I think and most of the time. That's when you know it's natural <laughs> too, right? Dude. That's when you know it's all natural. What's crazy is like most of the time there's this period after the action that I take that it sucks. It's hard. I'm going through all these trials. And I'm, I'm sure you understand this, but you start battling yourself mentally. Like, did I do the right thing? Yeah. And then eventually you see the light and you're like, yes, I did do the right thing. Okay. So tell us, so you're, take us after high school then. Yeah, then what sure. are you doing next? I grew up in Utah. So that's obviously where we're here. Uh, Orem and Spanish Fork. Okay. Orem, elementary school days, Spanish Fork, high school days. So up until like high school and stuff like that, very <laughs> traditional, um, Latter-day Saint upbringing, you know, you live in Utah. Typical Mormon upbringing. Yeah, yeah. you just kind of have a structure. So I did the typical high school thing and then went on my Mormon mission oh, in really? Los Where'd Angeles. Oh, really? Where'd you go? Los, Los Angeles. LA, baby. Love it. Um, 909? 
Uh, no, the two one three baby, real LA. I got a nine zero nine number. <laughs> if you didn't notice, two one three three two three. Let's go. Um, but that you know that's an interesting part because everything I've done again is like to please people, to please people, whether that was society, my family, whatever it is. I just knew that there's certain un- subconsciously you just do check mark things and you can progress. So nothing really changed in my life until after that because only after I was a missionary slowly did I start making choices for myself while still being insecure about what people would think of me because growing up again when you do certain things and you care about what people think whether it's your parents or your peers every decision that you make is based off of will someone like me or not like me or how will I look in public yeah including being a missionary, yeah. including all these things. So only after then is when my mindset shifted. Why did it shift? Because I fell in love with music really? and EDM, like 2008. Huge and like, left hook you just hit me with. Yeah, I did not know we going there. Okay. Dude, like crazy. And music has always been a part of my life. I mean, grew, 90s, I'm 35, FYI. So 35, 90s kid, Yo! MTV raps, <laughs> um, VH1, the box, like all these old school like channels. So growing so up, that was in the more 90s, important than being dude, accepted. Well, that's what made me. That was what made me different all the time, because back in the day when you couldn't find like what music was fresh and up and coming, you relied on skate videos. So I've always music has always been an important part of my life. Uh-huh. Hip hop, whatever. The new age of hip hop after my mission is EDM. So. When I first kind of saw Justice perform live and then I got into like Daft Punk and all these kind of French producers, I knew that there was like a future within music that I wanted to be a part of. But being a return missionary, growing up in Utah County and a farming community nonetheless, um, that's not the norm. Yeah. So I would hide that from my family. What do you want to do? do like it. produce music? I or? wanted to be like Skrillex and Diplo. You wanted to be a DJ. I wanted to be a DJ. So I did start DJing and started a DJ career here in Utah. No way. Um, and like I competed in the 2000, I want to say 10 or 2011 uh, Salt Lake City Weekly spinoff. So I was one of the top DJs in Utah. And so you went high school, then Mormon mission. mission. When you and were 19, it, you went on your mission probably. Right? Yeah, 19. So you two came back, you're 23. Crushed it. You're 20 so 21, 20 came back. 22. 20, yeah, 22 years old, somewhere right around there. Started and a DJ business. Started, basically. no. So I just started getting into music. Okay. So now I'm 21. I can go to clubs, I yeah. can do this. And um, the friends that I was with, they would take me to the local uh, club local club Salt Lake City anyways the only one that was playing like the dope music so I just fell in love with it and my friends that were DJs I fell in love with the way that they could just play music and the crowd would move so seeing that from a local level to a big stage level somewhere there was a connect where I was like I want to do this and I can do this and so I'm gonna hop five years after that where I knew that if I wanted to be in the music industry and music career that I needed to A, learn how to produce, like you were saying, or figure something else out. Because up until that point, I was DJing, I was getting into clubs, and I was doing it, again, to be cool. This is the thing. It's just hiding insecurities, doing what I love, but still my insecurities were overweight um, and not being liked by people. So I w- again, even though I loved music and DJing, part of the reason I did that was to fill this void of was being like. Was someone that you looked up to or like were your friends all into it? Yeah, so Jeff Larson was my main inspiration. He was a great friend of mine. He's the one that like really kind of showed me how to, showed me the ropes, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. turn turntables and stuff. But you liked it. You liked the music. Loved but it, it also dude. just the people that you looked up to also liked it. Exactly, and you to be them, right? exactly. And Interesting. When you look up to guys, like even on a larger scale, like Skrillex, A-Track, Diplo, um, I knew that I was missing that piece, right. which was like there needs to be a business attached to the music or you're, or you're nobody and you're just another artist that won't, you won't make it. If you don't make music, the only real DJ that doesn't really make music is like a Steve Aoki. And they're all personal brands? Yeah, that's it, dude. Like 
that's what they do. Yeah. And so I decided I'm going to start my own record label. I have enough music friends that make their own music. I'm in the scene enough. I can do this. And so I decided that's that's my thing. That's what I'm going to do. And so I started a label, and it, it's called, because I technically still own it, Damn, son. Damn, son. <laughs> Damn, So this is son. like 2010, you start Damn, yes. son? Yes, <laughs> 2011. I trademarked the name. And I just start a record label that changed my life. This is years after. So you start, I started making my own choices. Another choice that I made where I took a risk and just didn't necessarily You in Salt Lake care. at this point too? Yeah. I started in Provo, back and forth from Salt Lake. But that was the first time where I just took an idea and it started happening. Interesting. And so started getting anyone artists. Else by yourself? Myself and my friend Cade who is like my co-founder, one of my best friends. I told him the idea and he was like, dude, I'll help you. Like I'm all in with you. And that was awesome because most of the time when you have crazy ideas, people won't believe you. And so I had told this idea to a couple friends and it was either that's nice or you're ambitious. But Cade was like, I'm all in, like, let's do this. And so we did, we started it, we got a roster, we made our name for ourselves. We were named the best new lifestyle brand of Salt Lake City. And Damn we, Sun. Damn Sun. We won awards nationwide because we started distributing music. So um, Symphonic Distribution, which is a, a worldwide distribution company, awarded us best branded label two different years in a row. And then the artists that we managed, um, the first two artists, are now worldwide producer, household producer names, known as X and G. How does that work? <laughs> like, so you just went at them and say, hey, I want to be your record label. So believe in people, right? Think of you all found the young hustlers. Then. Dude, young hustlers, people that are in the scene that are into what you do. And there's always people that they just stand out. Like when you and I met, same thing. There's one, if there's a gift that I have that I'm very thankful for that I don't understand why I have it is I can find talent and know like that's hot. Yeah. That's good. Whether it's music or fashion or people. Yeah. It's a gift. It's a gift. And so these guys were, I remember just hearing and telling Kate, I was like, these guys won't be on our label like much longer. Because they'll outgrow us? They're just so Dude, they were on another level when we found them, <laughs> and they're and we're nobodies. So, so did they kind of put you guys on as a brand. I mean, you put as, your... yeah, as a team, we did a lot of things together. When they part, because it was they, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, I got you. But anyways, they played a major role, and why I hold them so dear to me is because what I saw them do together, and how we were doing this as a team, and how we were together growing, I realized this is how it should be. Mm-hmm. Like there's, it was just basically us three that kind of like kept on the trajectory of this is what we're going to do of music and branding. And so as you we making money at that point, never made money never off made of this. Money off I paid my dues. Yeah. I would fund shows. Yeah. I would fund gigs. I would, when we were tour touring, Christian Aaron and I, um, I would pay for all the gas and like get us to where we needed to go yeah. because I believed in them so much and I cared nothing more and helping my friends and having fun and building this label and thinking long term. So I always had a job to, to so find that, this oh, hustle. This was your, like, almost like your side hustle. A hundred percent side hustle. hundred percent side hustle. Okay. So you liked the journey so much that you were just kind of, who cares about the money? Let's go for this. Yeah. Unreal. Okay, so you're 25 at that point? Yeah. I mean, yes. I'm... Th- the whole thing, the whole journey of Damn Sun started when I was around 26, 25, 26. Fast forward, and I ran it until I was 31. And I stopped because there was a point in my life where it was like, okay, it's not done yet, but my life is starting to see the benefits of this hustle. The doors are opening up. My talents are getting better. People are hitting me up to do certain things because years of traveling and taking photos and learning how to market and doing right by people honestly right like yeah building good connections 100 it, nice it goes people. right back to that so what did you do next i got a pro- well i left utah went to seattle because i was like i need a fresh start 
I don't I don't want to be in Utah anymore where I felt like I was on this hamster wheel mm -hmm. very safe mm -hmm. if I don't want to do music I know enough people that I can get a job and being a college dropout in Utah <laughs> It's easy to like kind of you can you I could live the rest of my life in Utah with and be okay but I wanted more and so I knew that again the risk taker in me I knew that to prove to myself and to everyone that has ever doubted me up to that point that if I'm really as good as I say I am at XYZ at that time it was design and photography and branding were you doing that for your i artists? was just doing it for my artists for myself so that's where you learned marketing most yeah and and i yeah. was hit up by companies like even stevens or michael McHenry to help him with his brand or that brand and a bunch of different like in the valley fitcon uh fearcon all like all these cons like i just started learning and not and being relentless at putting out content quickly if you know and nice and that paid my bills to do the music thing yeah. and i just got i was sick of it so the next step was seattle which didn't last very long because i was headhunted by um a company called k swiss i've heard of them <laughs> <laughs> i've heard of classic them. sneaker brand which was a dream come true because they had opened up a, a window of opportunity for me years back um on a reband on a rebrand where they got a hundred different creators from around the world i was one of them and um it just ties back to relationships where i kept that relationship open and as they started getting into this new level of young hustlers um of creatives and that was the direction when they looked on the feed and when they looked at the community i was the guy yeah were you were you building a personal brand on Instagram at this point? Instagram and Medium. Okay. And Medium. Yes. Medium is a blog format. It's just like you write right, articles. Yeah. Um, and that's I, how you were gaining your community. and. Yeah. It started obviously all on Instagram because Instagram is where everyone goes to. They yeah. like beautiful photos. And yeah. if you're doing events and working with artists and putting out beautiful photos, you can get a following. Yeah. When I moved to Seattle, everything changed because I had more time, no friends, no connections, no anything. And so I started writing, excuse me, a series that I titled High Five Friday. Every Friday, here's five things that I'm doing to better myself, to level up. So a quote, a podcast, a thought, an actionable item. And on Medium and Instagram. On, me on Medium, yeah. So the structure was I would write the article on Medium and then blast it out in different forms yeah. on LinkedIn or Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Um, that was all tying back to no, no like sale, right? It's just, Dude, Hey, I'm Omar. I'm Omar. I was a 31 year old living in Seattle with no job, barely had a place to live that I found like a 200, 300 square foot w apartment with no bathroom in downtown Seattle. It was, insane and then i worked at chipotle no way to, dude. <laughs> yeah to pay my bills and you're just I'd, making content making content i'd sold i had 17 dollars to my name when i left utah and maxed out credit cards like i had no reason to succeed and i just paid my dues every single day with a smile and yeah i didn't care about anything other than creating a future for myself through what i was good at and it was enough to get the attention of a global brand. It was enough to do enough side hustles to pay rent and move into a nicer studio and do and move around like I needed to and get myself out of a financial situation that I had put myself in. Yeah. And again, no reason to succeed. There's no reason I should have succeeded. And so back to my question, you didn't have anything to sell though, right? It's like. No. Just follow me. I just yeah. want your attention. Yeah, you right? could buy my merch if you wanted for Damn Son. That was but it. But that was it. Yeah. Okay, so you got went on with K-Swiss. Then what did you end up doing with them? With K-Swiss, I became the head of social media. So I spearheaded um, a bunch of things. I built their community from like, I grew over 100% in the is time this that was there. Is this 2012-ish time? This is 2016 to oh, wow. and. Actually, officially, I was there 2018 to 2020. Holy crap. Okay. So 
I'd been in contact with them for years, but officially, like, I'm downtown Los Angeles, HQ, full-time employee. In case was is big at this point, right? They were point. on. They were on the trajectory. Because they've been around for a they've while, been around right? For a minute. Every yeah. Any parents listening to this, they'll be like, they I remember K Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you, they want to revive their brand to become now modern and. Dude, cool they were like again, entrepreneurs, right? young hustlers. This is a thing. And this is when the Gary Vee collab was happening. Exactly. Right? So, and I had known about that before. So I just wanted to partner with Gary Vee. I wanted to obviously. I was already wearing K Swiss before any of this happened. Really? Way before. Is that how they caught your attention? That's how they caught. That's you how tag I tag them or something. If you go on the very beginning of K Swiss's Instagram, it's my shit that they're posting. Really? Yeah. So. <laughs> so they hit you up and they're like, "Hey, come run our social media, basically." Basically, in like a roundabout way, but it yeah. turned out with like it was me, Gary V, Tyler Babin, and Barney, who's the president of K Swiss, in an elevator like manifestation because i tweeted this is 2018 june 1st i was like all i want for my birthday is a picture of me gary and barney yeah june 26th the day after my birthday i'm in la and that is happening how um because of case uh, yeah exactly the stars aligning they offer me a job i'm living in seattle and i don't even think about it. i'm like dude i will be here in two weeks and I just flew right back to Seattle, packed up my stuff. That whole shebang, came to LA, one way ticket, one more time, like, this is it. And with K-Swiss, I ran their podcast, I did the Gary Vee collabs, so CEOs wear sneakers, I took over that with Barney, I started my own podcast called Turning Pro, and that was an amazing experience. I ran all their social, copywriting, scheduling, posting, influencer collaborations, and then with my team, you know, we did a bunch of stuff. So I got to work with, like, Dan Aykroyd uh, for the Ghostbuster stuff, uh, with Clueless, with, uh, um, fuck, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to start name dropping. It doesn't matter. I got to do a lot of cool yeah. shit and learn that through hustle and ambition that you can make wild dreams come true if you just stick to the thing. Yeah. How, what did you bring to K-Swiss that they didn't have before? Like, what did you, what was your main i don't want to say everything but everything <laughs> give me well dude think about your were think they about thirst were they posting before like yeah but it wasn't like the, everything was super polished and pro and and, and, and that's fine yeah. that's yeah. fine but think about thirst think about if you had one customer that was just like the best customer the dude that you're like this guy gets it that was me for k-swiss yeah so it was like they knew that they needed someone who could speak the language relevant right and not fake it so who's hungry who's scrappy who's an entrepreneur who knows gary v who knows the mission who wears k-swiss already yeah you don't you didn't have to sell me on it how how was uh meeting gary v for the first time <laughs> any of the times the second time uh after what? like the third or fourth after like the second time it was normal he's just a regular dude that is doing his thing and yeah. and that was like i didn't have to fanboy anymore it was like yeah. dude you help me out i'm here thank you yeah and i'm just gonna continue you know it's worth like i never talk about gary v but i will i would be the first to admit that like the dude is is definitely like set a tone and coolness behind doing like being a nice business person to be honest yep. a nice business person that works for what he gets you yep. know what i mean and clearly has become like a leader in people my age up to f all ages now, right? How was, uh, how was that? Like anything that stood out to you about him or just seemed like a yeah, normal so guy? Yeah, so here's the thing like about Gary. 10, not even 10 years ago, before I started my record label, right when I started the record label, I had a friend because um, my tagline was do what you love. That was my thing when I yeah. first started the label. And he gave me a book black cover book with green edge and he said you remind me of this guy his name's gary vaynerchuk and i was like what put the book away three years later when someone said gary v i was like why do i know that name i said i pulled out the book i'm like oh my god why did i leave this on the shelf yeah. just crush it so i've had followed gary for so long so to meet him was at first it was like oh my god gary v like but then after I, what you just said is, I think, why I... Gary had set this tone of be this kind of person and follow your dreams, and, and that's all I needed from him. Yeah. It's um, almost like you get... He gives everything he's got just on Instagram. 
right? You know who Marshall Lynch is? Uh-uh. He's like a very famous football player. Oh, I'm Marshall not, Lynch. Yeah, 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 I do. Complex Con two years ago. This is how Gary Vee is with every person. Marshawn Lynch passes the line because he is who he is, and um, he wants to meet Gary, literally waiting. Gary is hyper-focused on this one gal pouring her heart out, yeah. and he's giving her advice. He did not give a fuck who was there waiting. Yeah. Gave that girl 100% attention. Marshall Lynch or whatever, he left because he couldn't wait. He didn't care. And that's all I needed. Like I'd seen Gary so many times, but yeah. that one experience that's who gary is yeah that's dope um okay so you do k swiss you ended up leaving there then yeah k swiss was amazing beautiful experience beautiful team shout out barney for literally giving me an opportunity when he had no reason to yeah. a president of a company hiring some random kid who one of like his best moves him. of all time yeah i mean yeah it was one <laughs> of his best it. moves um so now you're at WAGS. I'm at WAGS. I had a pause because it goes right back to what I told you as far as like I started making choices for myself with the music scene. But when I really left to Seattle, when you start making choices for yourself without a selfishly, when it's like I need to better myself for me because it's me and not other people, things change. And I got to that point with K-Swiss with this pandemic going on and it had started and I didn't like who, I didn't like being cooped up in a, an apartment by myself, and I didn't like certain things. And I realized what I didn't like was that I wasn't in control. So I decided while I'm here, I'm going to take control of my life as much as I can because that's all you can do. And I decided to take control of my mental and physical health so much, so intensely that I knew that I had ended my time at K-Swiss and I gave them a month notice and quit really? without a job lined up. I was just like, I'm done. And then you found WAGS. I didn't find WAGS until later, but yeah, I just left K-Swiss. I started still hustling. I was starting to shoot photos for our mutual friend, Michael McHenry. You just do what you think is best. I in just the moment, follow huh? what I need to do. And I work with people that believe in me and let me be the creative I need to be. And when you let someone do their thing, they shine. And I was given that opportunity to shine. And if I, that if it wasn't for Michael believing me, letting me be a part of his thing, WAGS Capital would not have noticed me. They wouldn't have reached out to me. And a handful of things that have happened in my life that I you know skipped would not have happened. Yeah. But yeah. So now you're with WAGS Capital, which is a restaurant group yes. that owns a bunch of different brands, exactly. right? Yeah, WAGS Capital is a powerhouse restaurant group. They own um, a, a few various concepts. The listeners will know some of them. So they own a handful of crumble cookies. I've heard of it. Uh, <laughs> they make some sugary stuff. Yep. Um, then they own 30 Ever Bowls, which is a super craft acai bowl. Uh, restaurant or whatever chain so yeah. they own all of them and then they own coconut island grill dirty bird which are is these the concepts they bought then or are they founded they so bought they, and then grew they buy them and grow them yeah yeah and minus the crumble crumble is you know their thing but ever bowl they bought that company straight up and they work with you know them i with our team we don't really touch that one too much but coconut island grill we have full creative control and our team does all the creative. So that was bought from a couple, and now they're scaling it. Same thing with Dirty Bird. Bought the concept, now scaling it. And then I'm wearing a shirt for a new concept called Hello Sugar. Same thing. Bought it, and now we're scaling it. Incredible. So creative director of all those brands. Yes. And, like, you guys are doing a ton. I thought we were making a lot of content. First place I want to go, you have an unreal story, by the way. <laughs> See to my expectations. First place I want to go is, like, I think you and I can help people more than most people can. Uh, I was just on a franchise call, like I told you, with all the Wetzel's Pretzels franchisees like in the country. And it's interesting to me how they are looking for ways to increase sales and there hasn't been an initiative or hasn't been uh, education around like using social media, even, if, even as a franchisee, or to explode your business like and I'm biased because social media 
is completely the thing that is put thirst on. I mean, back in the day, first couple of years of thirst, like really no one came. Like I'm talking like 100, 200 bucks a day. Like really like no one came. I specifically remember an instance of like watching Netflix in between cars like in the first year. That's how slow it was by myself. And um, going all in on, and this is about the time, like six years ago, about when Instagram started to become like, it wasn't always the attention platform of our society, right? But I kind of jumped on there and just went all in, like just like the style that I am, like kind of like you, no matter what I'm doing, I want to be the best at, I want to do it the biggest, I want to go hard at it, I want to get every, give it everything I got. Long way to say like social media has just blown up my business by going all in on it. Let's help some people because I think it's tough. So even let's talk to like Wetzel's franchisee owner. Let's start there. Like what I was meaning is that in a world where I think authenticity is king when it comes to business and marketing. Like I think people come, choose thirst over competitors because they know the story of thirst. They know me, they know all the other team players that I have in here and what they're working on. And I think the biggest thing for a business owner right now is make an account and instead of trying to go take the best photo of your product even, or you know write the best ad or make the best video, which is the first thing people think of when they think of social media marketing. How am I gonna make the best photo? How am I gonna make the best video? I think the best way to do it is flip the camera around and just talk. Just say, hey, I'm Ethan. I own this franchise out here in Dallas, Texas. We've got this on our menu. Here's some stuff I'm struggling with. Here's some stuff I'm excited about. Here's some stuff I'd like to share with you guys. Tell the story. Tell the story of your business. What's your take on like, a hot take on how you can help someone who's not good at social media for their business or is intimidated to jump in or let's help some small business owners. Like what can, what are some strategies? What are some tactics? Dude, best question ever. I love it. <laughs> Number one, don't be something you're not. That's just like a rule of thumb. <laughs> if you're fake, dude, it will just stick out so fast yeah. and you will look dumb. Yeah. That's just the fact. Yeah. Don't be something that you're not. Do not try so hard. When I look at some accounts and I'm just like, damn, bro. Give me an example. Call, call a little something oh, out here. Come on. Dude, I'm not going to call anyone out. But Are you talking more of like a personal brand? Both. You yeah. have to like... For a restaurant, I'll start level, uh, I'll start with the individual. Don't be something that you're not. If you're a business owner, like you said, flip that camera around and speak your truth. Like, there's something powerful about authenticity and saying it how it is because people can relate to that. You told me you thought that a personal account as a business owner is more important than the account for their 100%. actual business. 100%. Explain that. Dude, the purse, people buy from who they like. And in a digital world where authenticity and transparency is key, people like the story and they like the, the characters in the story. So the characters are more valuable than the main piece because yeah. the characters make the main piece. Yeah. And so you, people are buying from you and your story. Your product is just a byproduct of you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's, it's just the most, your vehicle. Dude, <laughs> it's the most important thing to build your your brand and everything else will follow under because if you're authentic and you're crushing it no shit no wonder why you're crushing it yep and if you fake it it will be known if yep. you buy followers if you buy likes you better keep paying for that otherwise yeah. you're going to look dumb when you post something and you get five likes yeah well i'll tell you the story of how ethan from thirst started because it's back in the day it was just thirst i remember the when i started going all in it was his first year and no one was coming. I uh, was watching people like Gary Vee and others go all in on social media. I'm like, I can do this too. I was on the Thirst account and I just started tell, I remember I was trying to hang like uh, this like Christmas like ornaments on the roof of our downtown store. And I just got on the stories and I started like telling, hey guys, I'm up here on the roof trying to hang this thing. We'll see what it looks like. <laughs> trying to do a big promotion out of this to get you guys in here. I started telling the story of it. And then I did things like, Thirsty Mom TV, like where I'm talking every week to the moms that are coming through the drive-thru. A couple of years later, and I continue to do that, still do that. And I think it's really important. And sometimes it's literally on my schedule to go do stories on the Thirst account because I want to make sure it's still really authentic in storytelling. That's because a couple of years ago, I started Ethan from Thirst. 
speaking of Gary Vee, I've actually got on a call show with him once. Hell yeah. I was so excited. I was so excited. It was right around the time when it was like two or three years ago. I had just started my Ethan From Thirst account. And I was like, this is my moment. I'm on the Gary V <laughs> show. I'm like, Gary, I got to tell you about this strategy I'm doing right now at my store. <laughs> like, talked way too fast, swore way too much. My mom, I don't want my mom to hear it. <laughs> it was like, I, I go, Gary, I created an account called Ethan from my business's name. Like the business owner's name from the business. And originally I did it because I wanted to go into the comments on Thirst. And when people were, were commenting on a Thirst post, I wanted to respond with, Ethan from Thirst, just to give that little level of extra authenticity, because I wanted them to know that Ethan was the one responding to them, you know, as we were getting a little bit bigger and bigger. And since then, it's become into me telling my whole story of entrepreneurship. But I think that's the biggest thing, whether you're a franchisee owner, especially, it makes sense as a franchisee owner, too, because I'm seeing this real world problem of like, how do you find the place and how do you find the place for someone who owns a franchise? to do marketing, I mean, you're in this world 100%, where, because you guys own uh, some franchises, or one, right, where corporate does the marketing, right, quote unquote, and you're kind of, that's part of the reason you bought a franchise, right, because you knew it'd be busy and corporate's doing the marketing, but I think the best way to do it is, if I were doing it, I wouldn't even have a Wetzel's Pretzels Dallas, I'd, it would, I would be Ethan from Wetzel's Pretzels in Dallas or something like that just to tell my story because like you say, who cares about the product? It's all about our story out here. And so yeah. I think for a franchisee owner, your personal account from your franchise's business name is the best first step and going on and talking and tagging them and seeing if they'll repost to a couple of their stories and share a little bit of the love. I think the biggest thing is telling your story from a personal account, especially if you're a franchise because it's way more powerful than trying to take really good photos, right? Let me interject before I forget this thought because we're still trying to give value to the business owners. Right. You want to know who your customers are? Look at your tagged photos. Look at the comments. Right. Two things you'll notice right away. You'll see who's buying from you and who are your core customers that love you enough that are going to tag posts like, without you telling them. Yeah. That's like, that says it all. And I can't stress that enough because if you're a business owner and you're marketing a product and in your mind I'm like this is the this is the customer I'm going for and then you go on your social media account and you're like actually it's a polar opposite of the customer I'm going for either you need to change how you're marketing or you need to adapt and right. be like this is who I'm speaking to and own it and build around that yeah I think that's a problem that a lot of people miss they have this like who my ideal customer is and they tell their marketing team to build content based around that where it should be the other way around in my yeah. opinion so do you spend time like did, are you and your team do you spend time on research do you feel like so my community manager is right here yeah <laughs> um izzy shout out izzy here's the thing i believe that um the research is done through engagement you get into all aspects of you know the dms and here's an example here's a research uh, strategy that I think any business owner can apply in a local setting. We're opening up a new uh, restaurant in Orem. Right. So I'm having my community manager do outreach based on searches on search on Orem. Yep. Location and, based on Instagram and, the and top, commenting right? and yeah. engaging and what kind of businesses are around or who's engaging with businesses and seeing who in that area, who's who. Yeah. And that's like, that is on your phone yeah. and that's some real yeah. life research and you get it. Right off of that, because this, it's hilarious because we do something so dang similar on, I think uh, it's on Sarah's checklist. Sarah's our community manager. We've, and by the way, this started and probably the same as you with us doing it, like by figuring this out, right? Because I'll take a tangent. That's the biggest thing is most business owners are not willing or taking it seriously enough to go figure this out first. Because that's part of the equation. Like They're like, I want likes and followers. Yeah, exactly. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> and also, you're going to waste your money if you go hire someone and have no idea how to train them or ask, expect anything of them to do. Like, you know what I mean? Or you're going to pay way more than you probably could have. If you're a small, if you're a local business owner, if you're a bakery, if you're a dry cleaners, if you're a whatever local single one-store shop, this, in my opinion, this has to be done by the owner. 
do and don't let don't get caught up in the mindset that you think you can do it better and that you're my son or daughter or someone dude no there's there's, no. there's a reason why people are good at what they do hire the right people to do the right thing if you get someone shitty that is your uh <laughs> my son can do this and he'll do it for free you're gonna get some crappy stuff yeah well i and i'll even i i'm even saying well think about it this way like the people on our instagram are the ones buying our stuff right this is the way i would like to explain it it's like if these people commenting if these people dming if all these people following seeing their posts these are the same exact ones that are customers whether they have a question in your dms or they have a comment about hey i don't I got this, but it was burnt this weekend. Or my cheese stick from Thirst was doughy, whatever it may be. That's the same to me as if I'm standing in this store and there's a line of people, mm -hmm. customers that just bought something that need to tell me something. Like, I'm pretty sure that any business owner would think that that's of high importance to talk and make it right with every single one of those. And even uh, to add to that is think of all the line of people that you're talking about. You have those five that leave a comment. What about the 80 that don't? That don't. You see it, yeah. They're on their phones. Yeah. Like these are our actual customers. And I just, I just think I would, I would be so bold as to say if you were a one location business and you were hiring someone for a low rate, low fixed monthly rate to run your social media, complete waste of money, in my opinion. Because I see it a lot where, it, whether it's an older business owner or someone who just, like, I have empathy. Like, you're in this shop all the time. Like it, for you to go learn how to do Instagram on top of that seems like an extra possibly unnecessary thing. You're focused on running your business, but to pay someone to be the direct line of communication with your customers who doesn't care who, if you're paying 500 bucks a month to a little agency that never comes to your business, has no care behind the way that they're talking to your customers. I think that's a waste of money. Like, Forget about having good things to post. Only post videos of yourself giving an update when you pull the cookies out of the oven or when you're closing the shop down for the night. Like only tell a story versus like letting someone else just handle it for you. Like these are actually our customers. Um, I, just, I just think it's so important. Like I wish I was, I'm trying to hold myself accountable for being more like disciplined about getting back to everyone on social too because like these are, especially, especially on my account, these are the people that are buying my stuff. These are the people that are like, ride or die, I'm going to support Ethan on everything. So I try to community. put that on a, to, to community. Build it. You build a community and you know the people. Same thing I tell Izzy. Like, who are you noticing? Who are the people? Build a community, engage with the community, and let that expand. Let's take a step up. So uh, now someone's on social media and they're doing okay, but in a world now where everyone's on Instagram, it's hard to grow on Instagram now just super, super organically without, without trying very hard. What are you doing right now? Say you have 2,000 followers right now and you want to take that to the next level. What are you and your team looking at for distribution methods of your content to get the word out to more people? Uh, I'm a firm believer in maximizing your time and the content that you put out. So if we're going to go film... Uh, a chicken sandwich. Well, that chicken sandwich that we're going to film, I need to have a video, a picture um, that's going to be distributed on Reels, on TikTok, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. And even if it's the same thing, how am I going to tell that same story multiple different ways? Because if I don't, if I can't do that, I'm missing opportunity and I'm not knowing where my real market is or yeah. where the voice is or where it's going to pop off. So I'm a firm believer in being relevant in all platforms, but finding where the, where the main platform of your story hits the most. Right. If that so, makes sense. So for me, if I'm understanding right, like for me, like Instagram stories are just quick for me. And I just, I like, I so like. So how do you them, make an Instagram people... story and turn that into a reel? Right. Because that reel will live longer. Right. So some things I film as a story and then I'm like, actually, I'm going to save this for later. I'm going to post it as yeah. a reel. Do you feel like the best strategy for distributing, distributing this content is to rely on the algorithm? Like, hey, let's, let's now do a reels because reels are popping off and those are getting us more reach. Or is it more like, hey, let's go find new accounts and comment on them and introduce ourselves to new people or work with influencers or run ads? Like, what's the best method 
you got content figured out. Okay. You're, we're sharing our story. No budget or budget? No, no budget. budget. No okay. budget. Exactly. Baby. So if you have hand no in hand, what do we got? Um, if We've you made our content. We're sharing our story. We're not great at it, but we're trying to take it to the next level. How do we get the word out? How do we get more people to see it? No budget. The easiest. It's all about attention. You know this. So where are you going to get the most attention? Right there. If you have no budget, I would heavily rely on what the current algorithm thing is, right, yeah. which is Reels. Reels and TikTok are competing against each other, so build content based around that. Beautiful photos is second. Like yeah. that, that is not even an important thing anymore. Yeah. And most people have an iPhone. I would only focus on an iPhone because you probably get the most perfect photo that's just crisp and that's taken care of. So build t attention wise, you gotta be creating a story that's um, gonna catch someone's attention in less than one second and the more because you want to stop someone from whatever it is that they're you have to stop someone from mindlessly doing something on their phone right. you have to catch your attention and videos is that thing like TikTok, it's no surprise you don't have to know an algorithm or anything to know that it's the thing yeah. so be on the thing and make content for the thing yeah i think that for me there's two ways right now it's one is a lot of how thirst got to be thirst which is hand-to-hand -hand combat for distribution. For instance, what I was saying on something on Sarah's checklist is, again, like you guys search the Orem, she'll use the location-based search function mm -hmm. around each of our stores each week. And so say our downtown Salt Lake store. She goes and finds everyone, 25 people posting around downtown, and she goes and messages them super authentically. Hey, my name is Sarah from the Thirst Drinks marketing team. I noticed by using the search function on Instagram, right there, those first two sentences. First. This is not a robot. This is sounds like it's Sarah from Thirst, who I just looked as a local company around here. Second, I know how they found me. This isn't a bot. Like I just posted and used the location tag downtown. Um, we have a location in downtown Salt Lake of Thirst. Would love for you to come support us. I'd like to offer you a free pretzel bite cup. No purchase necessary. Let me know how your experience is. Super authentic, super, super part of the community. Didn't ask for anything, gave them something. And I'll tell you, a couple things usually happen. First off, they probably usually follow us because that doesn't happen very often. I don't know about you, but a lot, there's not too many local brands that are reaching out up, to people, introducing themselves and saying that. So boom, you probably just got a follower. Second, they usually buy something else and they come in, right? So they got a free pretzel by cup, but they got drinks and really wanted to try the beignets too when they came in. Third, they again, to how that doesn't happen very often, they probably told everyone around them and the dinner table and their spouse about how they got this random DM and on and on and on and on and on. So I think it, for us, it builds a, literally a new customer into the door. Mm -hmm. It gets us a follow and engagement on social media and it's completely free. Like it's 100% completely free. This is how I did it from the very beginning. This same strategy, but to everyone, influencers, local people in the community, other businesses, DMing, like I think DMing is the fat. If you want to grow a following, yeah. you got to put in the work. Like right yeah. now, ever more than ever on Instagram, like, yeah, we need to use the content f to its fullest and work towards the way the algorithms want to see stuff. But after that, if you want to be, if you want to grow an Instagram today and be so audacious to make that statement that I want to grow an Instagram account in 21, 2021, 2022, you have to be willing to work for every last follower. Yep. Every you gotta be, hour. you said it, you gotta be real. That's it. That's why I like both of our beautiful community managers over there. Dude, there, I can't stress this enough, and I'm sure you can't either. You too, I'm talking to you. Like, you're the voice, you're the face, you're the most important part outside of us because you are. Like, you're the voice and the tone and the feel. And if you're not authentic, if you're not real, it's a missed opportunity on our part. Yeah. I mean, they're talking to the people that are paying for the infrastructure that we have to be sitting here right now, right? And social media is a customer service tool. When people DM, if they oh, want yeah. a response right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I mean, story of our life, right? <laughs> is The funny part is, too, when you be start becoming and connecting with people on there, it almost opens the door of, like, you know what? I, I do think I'm going to message them and let them know how I feel or otherwise like they wouldn't like you're not really messaging 
your these like Chipotle and being like, here's on Instagram and being like, hey, I just went into this downtown Salt Lake store and got like this person. Which said I this do, and, and they never respond. Right, they're never gonna respond. Versus, imagine if they did. Imagine if Toyota sent you a voice memo in response from someone on their team, and you know, you know who does that? Like, First form. Really. McDonald's. Oh, they just took really? an initiative. McDonald's just took an initiative to be so like, we're going to respond to everyone. First Forum has like a million plus followers. And the other day I tagged him in a post and I was like, hey, I'm using the app. And one of the employees, like, I don't know who it was, sent me a video message from the account. It's like, hey, I saw your post. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. No one, I mean, it sounds like you do it too, but I see very few companies that are doing that. And guess what I did? I placed a $200 order right after. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my best advice, because like I said, like I like to look at it very much from like a realistic, practical business owner lens. Like, right. For instance, my aunt owns a bakery. I was just helping her with her Facebook ads the other night. And I was thinking about it and I'm, I'm talking to her. I'm like, she's stressed about running her business. Right. And she wants, she's focusing on the quality of her product and you know, something like this, how fast the line's moving and hiring for the new store, all this stuff. I think one good tip is to figure it out yourself and defi definitely figure it out yourself, but then you can put it into a infrastructure that is the things you know is right are into checklists. Like I love checklists for marketing after I figure them out. So like whether it's for my food truck, whether it's for um, Rachel and her team stuff, it's like, hey, we know that reels are big. All right, we're gonna now figure out the best way to make reels right now around a, a trending hashtag or sound. We figured that out, we did a bunch ourselves, and now it's on our marketing person for the trucks checklist to go make five reels a week and to respond to every comment and DM and to do 30 direct messages a day about the drop that we're at with the food truck. Like you can put this stuff into a system. You just need to understand, and you can do it for cheap. Like, if you're gonna go hire someone who's great at marketing that knows these tactics, they're gonna charge you for it. Like they, they put in the work to figure out how to know that that's the great, most relevant stuff. If you've put in the work to understand what's going on and then you can bring in someone with no, little or no experience and be like, here's what you're gonna do. I understand it myself. Let me show you how to do it. Let's, let me follow up with you weekly on hitting these marks works like you can put marketing into a system as much as i'm saying you have to be the one yeah you have to be the one first because you have to know what to expect but then after that it's practical to hit all these it's practical to respond to everything as long as you put it on a pedestal of importance which is the next thing i'm going to say shout out to this business down the road it's called happy tooth it's a dentist office right and they started a year ago or something they've gone all in they go, they post their, make reels every day with all of their team. They do all these different series. They do, they post a ton. All of their story highlights are filled out. Their bio is rocking. They're on every platform. Like if you go all in, there's very few people just going all in and putting it on the highest importance and it's not working. They're, that's few and far between in my opinion. Like if you see someone really hustling and giving it everything they got, usually their account's grown. Usually they're, they're seeing results from it. And so I just think, I, I remember like talking to my aunt and she wants marketing tips, right? About how to get more people in her bakery. The first thing that came to my mind in that moment was this just takes an unreal amount of work. You just gotta be pot committed. You gotta think this is as important as making the pies in your bakery. This is as important as, as anything else. You, if you go all in, it will work. It's just a matter of putting in the work to get there. That's my, my take. Should we wrap it up? Let's wrap it up, wrap it up. But let me ask you one quick question about just kind of leadership in general. Um, tell me about, we were just talking before about sometimes you got, I'll just, I'll take it back. Something I've been thinking a lot lately is I think I have one or two more clicks like in the tank of Ethan. And it's interesting because like I'm, I'm known around, as Ethan from Thirst for being like, oh man, he's always working. He never stops working. Like that's my constant rep, right? And it's true, I, all I do is work. I put it priority over everything. I maximize all day, every day with it. However, do I know deep down that like I could be really nailing and maximizing like my life in other areas? Probably, I think I do. 
And I was, I was asking about this a second ago because your fitness game is unreal. I follow him on Instagram and I messaged him the other day because I'm like, dude, mad respect for how, <laughs> how well you hold yourself accountable for that because as someone who it looks like you're potentially maybe winning in all areas of your life and like really, you know, a successful person in all the areas, you can easily not be. You can be focused on one specific thing, you know what I mean? So talk to me about that. Like how do you, how are you holding yourself accountable in all these different areas? Because this is selfish. I just genuinely want to know. Fitness and business. Yeah, no, thank you so Relationships, much. Relationships, um, all this stuff. How are you doing good at all of that? I, I'm one day at a time. That's the answer, one day at a time. I remember one video really impacted me. It was a Joe Rogan clip, and it was um, Be the Hero of Your Own Movie. And that really resonated with me. This is like five years ago. And it hit me because if this was a movie, and Ethan's the... Ethan's the hero. What does that person do? What does that person say? What do you look like? How are you acting? How are you treating people? How are you treating yourself? Do that every day. And so, like I told you during the pandemic, when I looked at myself in the mirror, I have a video clip on my phone. It's disgusting. I look like shit, mm -hmm. a slob. I'm hung over, bags under my eyes, and I'm just unhappy. I have a dope career. I'm You're like, grinding and at dude, work. Yeah, like I thought I was in decent shape because I could run 100 miles a month. I'm living in downtown LA. I'm working for a sneaker brand. I'm working with like cool people. I have a collab in the works, but I'm so empty. And everyone else from the outside is like, oh my. You're gosh, crushing man. it. And then I had to tap into that hero. So I just, I wrote it down. What does my best self do? And I'm going to do this every single day from waking up at 5 a.m. to running first thing in the morning to making my bed to drinking water to reading a positive book. Simple things you can do every single day. The problem is to what you were saying is most people aren't consistent over time because it's hard to be consistently good at the things that make you better. People won't do it because it's hard. And so as a leader and in business, I just found that every single time in my life where I've been able to move up quickly, it's because I take control of those, those discipline. And so over the past 365, the fact that I've been over six months of complete discipline because I can track those months, my life has changed drastically from starting a charity, starting a new job, completely doubling my income based off of quality lifestyle choices and that translates to being a team leader and my team knows this like if i'm not my best how can i expect you to be your best yeah. i can't tell you to do something that i'm not willing to do yeah. and i can't be an effective leader if i'm not mentally like already trying to win my day how do you balance then like knowing that you've got all this in the tank and you can, you can get up at five, you know that you can do all this stuff versus like at some point if like you can drive yourself crazy being so anxious about like trying to be better and better and better and better and better. You know what I mean? Like, do you get anxious about that? Do you just have a ability not to judge yourself at some point or you know what I mean? Uh, I do know what you mean. Uh, no, I will. I'm never satisfied. Cause something that I'm think I think all the time is as entrepreneurs, our to-do list is, it's in theory never ending because we could just bite off a little thing we think we could get better, right? Everything could always get better. And it makes me super anxious. And also the fact that maybe it's also that I um, know that I have probably more in the tank that helps. Is I'll tell you what anxious, makes me yeah. anxious, not being my best. Yeah. Because think of all the work and all the stuff that you put into and if someone sees you and they see the opposite, that shit makes me anxious. Yeah. I don't want to be that goes right back to the fake the fake account, the fake person. I don't want to meet you and have and be someone else that you don't see. I'll end with this. You didn't tell me how the you told me about the insecurity right off the bat. Like how you're basically really valued what other people thought, right? Has that changed or where are you at with that in life? What made that change or my life? I, dude, my life changed 
to the direction I wanted it to when I stopped listening to what other people thought of me and when I stopped trying to please everyone. I don't care that I'm a college dropout. I don't care that I'm pursuing music. I don't care that I like photography. I don't care that I was living in a shitty studio for a little bit in in a world where my friends are getting married, they're graduating from college, they're starting, whatever it is. I had to stop comparing and comparing myself to the guy in the mirror and to the guy that's in my mind. That's insecurity stopped when I took complete ownership of that. And now I don't care. You mean like a couple of years ago? Yep. Interesting. Love it. So if you're not following this dude, you're making a massive mistake. Keep <laughs> the nation. Dude, this has been awesome. Been Thank super you. awesome. Uh, I like we were saying before, like connection, like from hustles, H- hustle respects hustle. And uh, I got a lot of respect over here for you. So likewise, I'm excited to see all you do, man. Thank you. Ethan Nation, hope you got some value out of this episode. I'm so grateful that you're here and I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for finding me on the podcast. Uh, If you're local to Salt Lake, come find me at a thirst store. DM me on Instagram at Ethan from Thirst. Thanks for listening, guys.